Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast. We're focusing on mental health in racing. We're doing this on the IndyCar side to start. Hope to do more episodes on this theme. Starting with my friend Gavin Ward, team principal at the Aero McLaren 3-car NTT IndyCar Series team. Team owned an offshoot the McLaren Formula 1 program, Gav, with very deep Formula 1 experience with Red Bull. During the peak of their success back in the Sebastian Vettel, Mark Weber era, moved over to IndyCar with Team Penske, race engineer for Joseph Newgarden. Two of them won a championship right off the bat in 2019. Some hard times, though, that had struck Gavin before he came here, but especially once he got into this new and high-profile role with Team Penske. So now that he is in a absolute top leadership situation at Aero McLaren. Fascinating to hear from Gavin about the decisions he's made, areas of health care, mental health, looking after things within the team. A lot of great folks there at Aero McLaren, but here we have a bit of a break from tradition. One of the many things that I appreciate about Gavin, motor racing we so heavily associate it with machismo and toughness and just grind through it and bite down harder and deal with whatever it is whether it's physical, mental pain, emotional, whatever it might be just absolutely grind your way through it and I appreciate Gavin saying you know what, I've been through this that doesn't work you can do it, but it really does hurt you in the long run and in a team based environment it actually makes us weaker so, working from his own experiences in life He has sought training and help here in recognizing some of the symptoms that might stand out. Other leaders within the team have done so as well. Share some deep insights about mental health, healthcare in my life, my mother. And so there's a a weaving conversation here. Greatly appreciate Gavin and also Lauren Gowdy in there, VP of communications at the time. She's now the head of marketing as well, but... This is not something that most people in this sport or professional sports in general would want to say out loud for fear of how they might be treated, seen as weak, seen as soft. Indeed, this is a superpower. Having recognized it, learned to deal with those symptoms, coping mechanisms, training sought by the Air McLaren senior staff as well to help the entire organization so really appreciate gav and lauren get rolling here in just one second time to say a big thank you to our show partners on the marshall pruitt podcast starting with faf technologies build to print composites manufacturing company they're specializing in medium to large scale automotive motorsports and military applications visit faftechnologies.com it's p-f-a-f-f technologies.com to learn more about their services and how they can benefit your business. Next, it's the Justice Brothers, makers of premium additives, lubricants, and cleaners, and servicing the automotive and motorsports industries for more than 85 years, with victories in all the biggest North American motor races, including the Indianapolis 500, the 24 Hours of Daytona. The Justice Brothers products are truly race-proven. Learn about their vast history and range of offerings at justicebrothers.com. If you're fond of awesome motor racing collectibles, including FAF Motorsports McLaren gear and goodies, pay a visit to torontomotorsports.com. And finally, we have a new online merchandise home for the podcast, thepruittstore.com. For all the show stickers, models, racing memorabilia I'm trying to sell and put towards our fun to buy a house is now live and rocking, thepruittstore.com. So let's get going with Gavin Ward. Team principal, Errol McLaren, topic that's very near and dear to me and has been since I was a child. Gav, I love the fact that your team, you uh, in particular, saying, you know what? That's dumb. That's that's not the best (laughs) way. Faking, acting, and pretending that things are great if they don't happen to be. That's not the best way for us. It's not realistic either, right? No team has a hundred percent happy people. Everything is good. Tell me about your 
I guess on the personal side, a bit of a journey towards some of the things you were dealing with and how you said, you know what? Uh, I wonder if this might be something for the entire Aaron McLaren team to consider breaking the stigma of never talking about such things. It wasn't an easy decision by any means, but um, I'll talk you through a little bit of how we how we got to where we are. <clears throat> I think, you know, I grew up racing is all I've ever wanted to do since I was a little kid. This was, this was my dream. And, uh, you know, I've been super fortunate to get to live my dream. <laughs> Um, and take part in some of the biggest races and play my little part and winning some of the biggest races in the world. But it's a high pressure place to work. I remember when I first started, first went trackside at Red Bull, I thought, this is too stressful. Mm. This is my, it was my dream, but I'm like, this, I am so stressed doing this. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> I, like, I don't know if this is something I can keep doing. And I, I adapted and I got better at that. And then, you know, I came to think I thrived on the pressure for a, for a long time. And it was actually later on, you know, having gone through that and been, you know, right in the thick of it for, F, you know, down to the wire F1 championships or uh, Monaco Grand Prix wins and thought I thought I thrived under pressure. And um, <clears throat> then I came to IndyCar and the Indy 500 and found myself, you know, certainly in a high pressure situation. I was engineering Joseph Newgarden. It was my first year as a race engineer in IndyCar. It was my first oval race engineer event ever was the Indy 500 in 2019. <laughs> um, we were going in second in the championship. You've got a championship caliber driver at a team Penske where you're expected to fight for the win. And, um, you know, Kind of to my surprise, I just couldn't quite handle that situation. You know, I, I and um, it caught me quite off guard. So having never really, you know, I've had, you know, to be brutally honest, like hard to be perfectly open it, through my life. I've had periods of, you know, feeling down or low mood or times being anxious. I think everybody goes through those. But um you know, it was the day before we started running at the open test. So the big pre month of May running for uh, the Indy 500. And I had a panic attack in my hotel room, mm. you know, but I've never had one before in my life. And, you know, it was terrifying. But I also I didn't feel like I could tell anybody about it, you know, and um and I thought that it would be seen as a weakness and that I couldn't do the job. And, you know, that was a, it was a, that was a high pressure year. I was stepping into this big role, but also expecting my, our first born at that point, you know, and I'm the only, my wife had moved over and because of visa situation, she couldn't work. So I'm like the sole breadwinner and you've got all this relocation. You're, you're kind of away from your support network. So there's a lot going on. You've got a, I think that all kind of like, mountain of pressure yeah. piling on your shoulder and then and i it, it just it just caught me off guard because i was kind of like but i got into a thought process there which was something i hadn't dealt with in all the other high pressure situations where i was like worried that hey in any 500 something that comes into your mind more than i think other racing i'd done is you worry about the safety of your driver and you know that's kind of was a, although i'd been at the racetrack for unfortunate incidents before it just never really was part of the picture when I was working in formula one, it wasn't really a, a high on your mind kind of item. And then I think also that picture of like you're supporting, you got family to support now, what happens if you screw up, you lose your job, you know, you can get into like a bit of a, a negative thought spiral. Um, anyways. And so and it's kind of funny because I, I remember you fast forward to the end of that year. Well, we ended up finishing fifth, I think, the 500 that year. You know, we qualified eighth or something like that. I think we finished fifth in the race, somewhere around there. We had a really successful, you know, quite a successful month of May, really. Um, Saturn Pagano won the race. You know, I was head of Vero for the, or helping lead the Aero program, I should say, at Penske. So we had, we, you know, we won, we won as a team. We had a good showing with, with new garden. 
we won the championship that year. Um, but I struggled a lot through that, through the month of May, kind of behind closed doors, you know? And, um, I remember thinking after oh, we were on the plane flying back from Laguna, having won the championship, like someday I'm going to tell people about <laughs> like the journey that this, this year has been, because it's kind of like, I think people and myself, you know, was guilty of like viewing those issues as a weakness or like something that people, you can still perform quite at a high level and maybe have these things going on. You know, at the end of the day, we won a championship my first year in engineering <laughs> in IndyCar. Um, Everything should be perfect. Everything should be magical. Yeah. You should yeah, and everyone, no, and nobody, nobody would think anything like that was, was going on, you know? And, um, but you know, there was a, there was also a, a positive outcome. The, the month of May was hard and that wasn't, I had, I was kind of battling panic attacks through the entire month going to the bathroom at the speedway <laughs> and like trying to get work my way through it <clears throat> on my own. But, you know, off the back of that, I got some help. I got some help with counseling, um, learned some coping techniques, you know, and actually managed to really get control of that situation, which is, which is great. But also it's funny because now now all the stuff I learned from going through that as a person, well, for one, it's maybe it made me a better race engineer mm. because when it was later in that year, and we're dealing with you know decision making under pressure and situations where you know you uh, where a, you know maybe your driver. Or your, or your team are dealing with some, you can, you can pick up on it. You're a little hypersensitive to it, but also you, you've been educated and I, I don't call myself a professional by any means, you know, but you've been educated on coping strategies and at least you can kind of share a little bit. Um, now I never, I didn't tell anybody at Penske what I was going through. And then maybe that's just me. Maybe I just wasn't comfortable with it at that point. You know, I wouldn't say that was like, it's because of the environment necessarily, but I certainly didn't feel like it was something I could bring up, um, rightly or wrongly, you know, that might've just been my own fears, I think. But, um, so yeah, that's, that was, and then coming into the, my first month of May with this team, you know, and I've been thinking about it ever since that, that year, I've been thinking like, I, someday I'm going to tell this story, but I like, I, doesn't wasn't really comfortable with it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just a hard thing to bring up. Also, it's still hard to talk about right? now. Yeah, it's it's yeah. hard to do that first day, like <laughs> on your first date. You're probably not revealing all of the most sensitive things about yourself that you yeah. think someone might judge negatively. So you wouldn't be expected yeah. to come into the team and all of a sudden reveal that. But uh, I I do respect massively respect Gav that in the elevation of your role, having come in as a technical engineering leader within Aero McLaren, then being elevated to running the team, uh, in that elevated level of influence, one of the things that came to mind to you was now I am in a position culturally, wherever the team's at when I came in was great. But now that I'm in a position to say, you know, if I went through this, I have to believe some of the amazing men and women on your shop floor or in any of the other departments, there's got to be a couple others like me, if not more than we might suspect. So you know what? Now that I can, maybe I can start thinking about the entire mental health team-wide and ways to take what I learned and went through and even if folks don't need it, at least having the, the, the commitment to saying, I want to open that door. That's a big thing to do now that you're in a position to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because even the day that I, so I, I we had a, we brought the whole team together for a huddle um, before we went into the month of May. And I thought I just sort of decided that now's the time to sort of, um, my message to the team 
was really, this is a high pressure month, you know, and everybody's been working their butts off uh, to get us into this. And I thought it was worth, I shared the story for myself and, uh, you know, my, my background and then shared kind of the, the team resources we have, but also kind of just wanted to encourage people to feel comfortable to talk about it. But, um, as again, I'm not a professional in this, but at least I want it. I thought it seemed like the right thing to do. I wasn't sure it was the right thing to do. <laughs> Even afterwards, <laughs> I wasn't sure it was the right thing to do immediately. I thought, well, maybe I screwed up here. <laughs> like, maybe people are going to think less of me. Um, but what was amazing was like the number of people and the people you would never have expected to reach out mm. that reached out after that was like absolutely gobsmacking. So, and people you just never would have guessed. And I thought, wow, that that's a, this is more common and it's a bigger deal than I even thought. So um, that kind of gave me uh, motivation really to, to, to do more, you know? And I think some of the people, you know, there's some people that seem that are, I think we're, I've been really good people to talk to about this, that, um, also kind of wanted to have always wanted to share that kind of stuff, but didn't feel like they could, or didn't want to, or maybe that there's not a position to do it. Do you know what I mean? Sure. I, it's a, it's a tough one. So, um, anyways, the team kind of looked at next steps and the, the UK side of McLaren has done some mental health first aid training. And I thought that's a really nice it's a nice thing that I like the, you know, getting more people on staff and it's, it shows the right direction. And um, so we looked at what resources were available around here. Um, and Jody, our director of people. And um, I think she found the, the resource we ended up using, um, which was a mental health uh, first aid training uh, group based out of Illinois. Yeah. Um, can't remember the name off the top of my head. No, but it, it's, it's an impressive yeah. thing. Having taken a look at it, you know, the mental, mental health first aid from the national council for mental well being, And yeah, the, that's the one, the training options. Unfortunately, we're not going to be referring to you as Gavin Ward PhD any point in time here. Cause I don't know if you're going for your doctorate in this. <laughs> <laughs> the things that they do uh, train or offer education in, whether it's from a perspective of almost like a first responder type approach, whether it's depression, yes. anxiety, you know, any yeah. uh, suicidal ideation. I mean, they, at least for what I've, I've read, they do offer that training for folks. Again, kind of that responder or keeping an eye out uh role but also just more educational things and whether it's coping whether it's recognizing roots uh, of thoughts depression the th again the things that rattle around in our head that go untended that that's often where problems can happen so seeking a well-established credentialed resource like this to educate you, other senior leaders within Aero McLaren, and also, again, just the, the down filtering of this to all of the people within the organization. That's massive, Gavin. I really hope, and I'm not saying Aero McLaren is the first, but I do hope that you aren't one of few to consider such a thing. I would hope the other teams in IndyCar and run through all the other series we know and love would consider such a thing because I don't know what your annual budget is, Gav, for physical training, personal trainers, <laughs> all the gym equipment and cardio that, right? Well, teams will spend a 
trillion dollars if they could to make sure that their pit crews and drivers are just the perfect physical manifestations. And you go, that's awesome. Look at all the muscles and you can run for a year straight and never break a sweat. But what are you doing to make sure the actual hard drive, the heart within those creatures is equally as tuned to such a high level. So again, I hope this is the start of something more widespread throughout at least the IndyCar paddock uh, that you're primarily focused on. Tell me about this adoption of this, this expansion into this, Gav, knowing that you're at three cars right now, you've got a lot of team members. Tell me about since this became something you've onboarded, are you seeing any kind of difference on the shop floor when you're going to test at the track, when you're going to do whatever it is in the, the mental or emotional state of the team collectively? What are you seeing there? Because we don't expect it to be an overnight change, but you would hope well, that's it. it grows. Yeah, and I think you, you nailed it with the training kind of uh, analogy because – Another thing we've brought on board over the last year is um, mental skills coaching um, for engineers and drivers um, as a unit. So basically get the timing stand unit working together with a mental skills coach. Um, and But going back a little bit, so how, what, what have we seen as changes? So, uh, you know, through the month of May, we had a great – Great month overall. Obviously, it's a heartbreak at the end of it, um, but that's racing. And I and I, I warned the team that the <laughs> many times over that we can't be too fixated on results um, because sometimes things are outside your control. So if you hitch all your contentment, all your self esteem, everything, which I've been there, if you're on the highs and lows of motorsport like a roller coaster, it's not sustainable. And one thing we're trying to do here is like my vision of like building a kick-ass race team that does it right, you know, takes care of people is that we want sustainable performance. We don't want to just chew people up and spit them out. We want to do this in a way that people feel like they can keep doing it and they're not burnt out. (laughs) Um, So there was that, but through, watching through the month of May, although overall a really positive morale, there were moments there where I could see people who were struggling and sometimes lesser experienced people, uh, whether that's just, they showed it more or it's just, you know, one thing that's dawned on me is we take these kids, whether they're at a school, those technical schools or engineering degrees, and we throw them into the biggest motorsport event in the world <laughs> This isn't straight in. swim in a 10 foot pool. This is a hundred foot. We pool. throw, we throw them right into it and we expect them to be able to c- cope with the mental side of it when that was none of their education and none of their training. And it's like, when you see someone struggling and you think, well, of course they're struggling. <laughs> like, <laughs> of course, like, why are we so, whether it's a pit crew member, whether it's, you know, an engineer who's under the pressure that's immense, you know? Um, so how do we be better at that? Well, I can't say we've solved it all, <laughs> but one, st- one starting point I think is getting that mental skills coaching as part of our program here, which I think both helps. The biggest impact I found with that, I think we've seen benefits and consistency of mood for drivers and we've seen benefits in quality of communication. But the biggest benefit is actually, I, I see as contentment, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. it's a happier with what we're doing because the, that learning those skills to cope with the frustrations and the pressure and all that sort of stuff that actually makes for like a better quality of life. I think that's the, <laughs> that's the bigger impact. So that that's been neat um, for sure. And, uh, but I think there's more to come. So 
we're planning to do for do more another session of the mental health data first training. I think that's good. Trying to find ways that we can kind of continue to make people feel more open with going to those people who've had the training or just having the conversations, you know, and being willing to kind of open up. I have heard feedback from a number of people that we've seen a lot more openness to talk about these things since then, which is great. Um, as I said, you're not going to change things overnight, but <laughs> um, I think we've seen a lot of positives. So that's good. Share a little bit of a, a longer tale here, which leads to one of my last questions. And I shared this, my story with you uh, just in a, a private call months ago, Gav. I've never, I've always shared this. It's never been something that I've hidden. Because my, my father was my equivalent of a mental health coach growing up. And it took me a while to realize that this was actually a superpower, not something to be embarrassed of. <clears throat> my mother um, uh, passed a while ago. She throughout her entire life was racked with uh, mental problems. And I think the majority she was born with compared to situational things which triggered those illnesses, um, she's bipolar, uh, she had multiple personalities, she was somewhat frequently suicidal. And so I grew up, it's like, I think I mentioned to you um, months ago, it's a bit like a kid. <clears throat> you often hear about, uh, hear from a kid, maybe might be an athlete who grew up in just abject poverty. And they tell you now that they've found success, they're so happy to be able to buy the things they didn't have, share, buy things for their parents, a house or other things that they have the means. But what they come back to usually is, I didn't know any different. This is what I grew up in. I didn't grow up poor while the rest of the world would look in and say you were extremely poor. I didn't have any other frame of reference to know. I just knew that was what was normal. And so that's what my uh, introduction to birth was like um, with my mother who uh, was often gone six months a year, maybe nine months a year in uh, state mental health facilities. And so growing up with her and a lot of the problems that she had where she'd go from being fine for a certain amount of time to trying to commit suicide or this is, I was too young to remember it, but uh, trying to kill the two of us, thankfully wasn't successful. I don't share any of this in any kind of negative, oh, woe was me kind of way, but that was my life and norm growing up. And my father, when I got to be about five and had enough brain cells to maybe process, he started immediately with me recognizing that if he did not intervene and pull me aside and say, hey, mom loves you, but she's got some things that are different from others. And so we're not going to see her for a while, but you're safe and okay. And I've got you. And, but, and if it was a big incident um, that was triggered by her, he would take time to sit me down and try and deconstruct what happened and explain that this, these are the roots and this is what you saw happen. No, it was scary, but just realize she's okay and you'll be okay. And he actively saw these little minefields that I could walk through that could blow up the rest of my life among the greatest gifts I've ever been given, Gav, was my father realizing my son could be headed for a life of misery. Uh, he's headed to prison. He's headed to an early grave. He's headed to a lot of things based on these crazy things happening to him through no fault of his own if I don't intervene. So super fortunate to have not only these things happen, even the bad things, but someone 
he wasn't a professional, but he was having to deal with this as a husband, father, small business owner to keep our world on track and keep me mentally in a place where I wasn't just spiraling even at a very early age. So I've shared that throughout my career with all the various teams I've worked with, especially those who were younger when I first got into motor racing was 16 or so and found that for the younger ones, those who are maybe within five or 10 years of my age, talking about life and upbringings and such, the sharing of that seemed to land well. And this is a part of, I mean, this is a really deep part of my life. To understand me, this is not something I can hide or share. So just shared it freely. But I found the veterans, the older, the grizzled ones. Didn't really want to hear it. That, that, that was me exposing a weakness, and I was often thought of as less than uh, or, or Uh, someone who wasn't as tough as he should be. I can tell you a lot of those veterans, um, those were the same folks who smoked two or three packs of cigarettes a day and Mm -hmm. knocked down at least uh, six, if not uh, a full case of beer each night in the hotel room. And that was their method of coping. Right. Instead of dealing yes. with whatever yeah. pressures, it was self medicating. Here's a cigarette that'll soothe me, or some alcohol that will quiet those things running around in my head. I'm not okay. criticizing those folks at all. Just saying that was, at least among many of the veterans that I worked with, they didn't want to hear anything about the mental stuff and just, you know, be tough and grit through it. But they did have their own coping methods. Curious what you've seen within your team, Gav, uh, knowing that you do have some veterans there. You also have a lot of youth, which is pretty cool, but have you seen any lines drawn between those who might be more open to this or less open to this? Because admittedly, in my career, I'm citing things from embarrassingly embarrassingly 35 years ago or whatever, 20, 30-plus years ago. yeah curious how you've seen that play out here within the range of of age and experience within our McLaren. Yeah. You know, I think first off, yeah, I love that you brought up how we, we did talk together before about um, that feeling that reframing what feels like a weakness at the time to be a really now a superpower. And I've, I've used the exact same phrasing before for myself, like, whether it was some training, you know, learning to deal with your emotions, whether it's anger, frustration, depression, anxiety, and being in tune with that and being able to recognize it in others and be able to help others with it. I think that is a superpower. Mm. And for what I do now, it's a huge part of what I do. You know, this is a people game. There's about, there's, we talk about race cars all the time, particularly engineers. We'll talk about all the geekery, of engineering all the time. But when it really comes down to it, it's a people game. It's really nothing happens without making people work well together and, and perform on the day and understanding that. Now, as for the sort of generational trends uh, in, in age trends, I think maybe things have moved a little bit since, since your experience there because I was, that was one of the things that was more surprising to me is that actually some of the people that reached out to me were some of the most experienced people, most accomplished people in the team that, and I, it was everything, everything from the, from, from junior right on through to the most accomplished people in the team. I got it. There was a cross section across the board, different departments, different areas. And I was, um, yeah, some of the people you thought would be stiff upper lip, cold about, or perhaps dismissive even in your head about that topic were, um, were the ones to, to send an email or a text message on the day. And mm-hmm. it's like, that was, it was really encouraging actually. So 
Um, yeah, interesting. So maybe things are getting better. I, I think they are. I mean, there's there's more openness to that, but it's still still a big still a big issue, obviously. But uh, um, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate your willingness. Um, your amazing head of comms, Lauren. I appreciate your collective willingness to open up about this. And that's uh, even a turn of phrase I hope will go away sooner than later. There, there's nothing here to quote, open up about. But there is a genuine belief still that talking about such things involves having to go beyond the norm of comfort and acceptance. So I yeah. do appreciate you, everyone within your house there, Gav, and your particular desire as, as the leader of that team to step out on faith and say, okay, I could walk down pit lane at St. Pete this year or Indy, and there might be a person or two who I don't think they're going to shout anything, but might look at me a little bit differently than they did before, maybe in a, a negative or critical way. I'll tell you what, though, brother, owning that and saying, you know what, I, I, okay, say it, think it, shout it. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for my tribe and my family. That's a powerful thing. So again, I, I'd love to do interviews like this with the owners or leaders of every racing team. So I'm hoping this isn't the first and only this is a really important aspect to what we do. And again, appreciate y'all for stepping out on faith. Yeah. You know, like it's been my kind of dream to change the sport for the better by basically setting the example that other people are inclined to copy because I think it's the right way to build a winning race team. But I also don't want to hide what we're doing here because I want to help, you know, if that influence that that's still the, the dream here. That's the vision is like, we want to be the, the shining example <laughs> of what it is to build the best race team and have other people copy it. If you know, to try and come along and do that in the right way. So it's a positive impact on, on, on the whole. So, I hope we can keep doing that. Um, you know, I hope we make progress. I, I love, love getting to do this job. Honestly, you know, it's, it, it's a hard, it's a hard way to make a living in some ways, but at the same time, there's very few days where I'm not thankful. So, um, but it's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also appreciate your ongoing commitment to being an influencer in running a IndyCar team while having long flowing locks. Uh, the, <laughs> that mop of hair of yours is just, uh, it's, it's beauty. It almost <laughs> needs a leash and to be registered with uh, the County, but um, <laughs> you, you are the, you're just IG influencer uh, above all there, Gav, but kidding aside, appreciate well, you. It's a, yeah. It took, it took, a, it took a long time to get comfortable with my own skin mm. and be like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to be me and try and be as genuine as possible and long hair. That's what I want right now. So that's what we've got. <laughs> Only we and, can get, uh, get Zach and Rossi. Uh, we, on want, the, on that. we want people to bring, bring their authentic selves. Oh Lord, you, you are succeeding in that. You, your driver trio <laughs> is a bit of a psychologist <laughs> dream right there. The, the, the different <laughs> creatures among Rossi, Malukas, and Pato, all beautiful yeah. and amazing, but uh, yeah, no better evidence of the fact. But that isn't that what's awesome? I don't know. I think is. that's just what's, uh, you look at, and it's just, you see the drivers, but well, I, it was almost every day during the month of May last year, where I just took a moment and looked around at the people that work at this team and just appreciated the characters. Like, isn't that what's just awesome about motorsport? I don't know. There's just, I just, there's so many wonderful people and there are everything from hilarious to, you know, 
peculiar to whatever, but um, I think that allowing people to kind of be themselves, but working as hard as they can to try and achieve something great and having fun while they do it. I mean, it's just, it's great. So all of my favorite uh, memories in the sport are attached to people, not cars, exactly, not trophies. Exactly. And some of them are wild. Uh, some of those the, people you're like, oh, I got to buckle in, but good Lord, Gav, you think of folks who aren't as fortunate as us to work in such a dynamic industry for so long. And between the eccentrics, between the introverts and everyone in between, we attract some amazing people to this world of motor racing. And yeah. Yeah. That means that since we're not linear in that capacity, right? The cars are, right? That engine in the back of your car, it's going to be the same engine the next race and the race after. But the people, they're the thing that are the most dynamic and can be uh, changing on a constant basis. So that's where adding a layer like this um, really does help you uh, help everyone to get to a better place. Well, you, you nailed it, and I'm just going to share an Alex Zanardi quote which I shared with the team back in August, 2022, actually, it goes, you know, when you're in your twenties, you always believe that the race, that the championship is the only thing that matters. But then 20 years later, you say, Oh, I remember when I was there with my mechanics, with my engineer, talking about the car, going for a pizza, going to the team, fixing my seat, spending time with the team. So you realize what really matters was the effort that you put in daily in order to build something special. Because when the championship arrives, you cannot expect to meet happiness that day. Otherwise, you don't get there. It's the process. <laughs> and I think that is nail on the head, but anyways. <laughs> and it's people. Thanks one final time to Gavin and Lauren. Bravery for sure. Big part of what he has done and what they're doing. Imagine that trying to win, become a championship winning team. I'll say, you know what? You have to be hard and mean and gristled and everything else you can actually be a little more caring and accommodating of each other while raging hard and being hyper competitive to try and win. We don't have to go all in one direction. We can actually be more balanced more caring and more kind people. And guess what? We get better as a team if we do that. So, so appreciative of him and this message and the lessons and the insights that he's brought to us. One more time, thank you to FAF Technologies, the Justice Brothers, TorontoMotorsports.com. I'm Marshall Pruitt. I'll speak with you soon.